Hi, my name is Andrew McLaren. Today we're going to talk about how you can make a final standards based grade or mastery grade looking at the different practices. And to do that, there's a couple parts of the video. I'm going to go over the main idea um, as well as show you a table and some Google Sheets that you can use to calculate this final grade semi automatically, though there's a lot of things where it's going to be up to you exactly how the grades are kind of put together. Um, I'll talk about my philosophy a little bit behind that process. And then we're going to go through an example of this and how to assign this in Google Classroom and how you can give different versions to different students. So the main idea of this table is that there's eight practices and students are going to be scored on these practices throughout the year. I have a couple different videos, um, for one for each of these practices where I have a way that you could grade this. And I even talk about them and how you can kind of put them together for a grade for that particular practice in some of the videos. And um, the final grade should integrate all of these to give an overall science grade. But you really do need to communicate all of these different areas where students are stronger and weaker to the next teacher. Because a final grade doesn't really communicate much. Like a B student could be very strong in one area and weak in other areas. And you don't really know where their strengths and weaknesses are. So it fulfills a similar um, thing as like standards-based tests, like the state tests. And they tell you where students are strong, where they're weak, and it helps you group students on uh, where they need help. So I think that's important to communicate to the next teacher. And then also an important element of this is that this is all about the assessments and how they do on these assessments and showing where they are with these skills. So it doesn't include any classwork which oftentimes students don't turn in because they may be defiant or they may have a hard like home situation. And so they're kind of coming into class distracted some days and not being on task. Uh, there's a number of reasons that they might have a hard time doing classwork, but then totally be fine on an actual assessment. And if they're not fine on an assessment, then that's, that's a much bigger issue for me. So we want to know where students are in terms of their skills to do science. And if we look at just these tests, that helps us do that. Now, if you have retakes and other formats um, that are familiar to them for each one of these practices, they should be getting better at this skill throughout the year, as well as having opportunities to improve their previous scores. I think that I've done this a couple times with CER and modeling, and students really do like rise to the occasion here and do these retakes if it's like their whole grade. If it's only a small part of their grade, they're not gonna do the retake. But if their grade is like determined by their performance on these tests, they'll retake them if they're not doing as well as they think they should be. So when I first made this table, I ended up making it in slides, but then I ended up putting it in sheets because it does some automatic calculations for you. Generally speaking, for me, I have a slight alteration of the standard standards-based grading. I like to use a three to zero scale instead of a four to zero. I like the categories strong, good, and weak. The being above grade level oftentimes is kind of murky and it's not super clear in different practices how that what that really looks like. And so I prefer this scale. It's also a little bit simpler if you've got less categories to determine what really is like at grade level and above grade level. So for me, strong is at grade level, but it also could be things that are a little bit above that. So that's the main idea for my grading scales, but then you're going to have these different scores for different assessments. I chose three here. You could have more than three, and you can add that to the sheets as well. It's fairly easy to go in here and say, hey, I want another column in here so you can add more assessments. And that should not mess up the function. It should kind of adjust the function as it needs to. So it was E and then it meant to F appropriately in the Sheets version. So I've plugged in a couple numbers here and you can see that it just automatically gets the average for you. And um, it will determine the final letter grade as well. I've got a version of this for Fs as well as no pass and no grade. So it pulls from like different versions of this table, like different numbers mean different letters, and it will do that calculation for you. And I've got both of these available in Teachers Pay Teachers in a link in the um, description of this YouTube video. So if you want to just use these, then you can just use these exactly as they are, or you can alter them as needed 
if you wanted to change the possible grades uh, and how they line up to letter grades, you can do that as well. But then you're going to need to slightly rewrite the, um, the lookup function here. So instead of having this be from here to there, you might need one more cell included. So instead of, um, what is this, R12 to S15, you could have it go down to S16 and have a different scale. But I'm going to keep this as is because I believe that this uh, 3 to 1 scale is a little bit clearer and um, students understand what strong, good, weak means. And then if there's no real data or if they're absent for that, then you can give them a zero. But that is like there's you can't tell how they're doing on that skill. And for me, there's also a way for students to get an A plus, And that's if they were to get perfect scores in all of their categories. So if they're at grade level for everything, then they get that perfect score or that A plus. So that's not included in the automatic calculation. You have to do that yourself. Um, so just be aware that there is that one more step in addition to the automatic rounding. In addition, I don't think that students should have a um, rounding piece for their final score for a practice. This is really their most consistent score that they're getting. So if they are if they've gotten one bad score at the beginning of the year or in the middle of the year, or even they got one bad score at the end, that shouldn't be their final score. But if they've shown growth throughout the year and they've consistently shown a higher score, like in assessment two and three, they did pretty good, then that should be what that final score is for that category. So I didn't want to do an average for the final scores per practice, but it's hard to put those all together without doing rounding. <laughs> So I did do rounding for the overall science score, but not for these individual practices. Um, it's just, there is different philosophies behind when you round and when you don't round. But for me, students must make tests up if they're absent for an assessment. If, they're, uh, if they get a zero, that means that they really haven't submitted anything or it's completely like, it's just not the practice at all. Like they may have misunderstood the practice instead of, like doing discussions or doing the asking questions piece, so they may have mismatched one of them. So you could choose to not factor those into the final grade, um, especially if they transfer in later in the year. So you could do like an NA um, for that student for that particular assessment. But by default, it's a zero does go in here because students need to do assessments. So the behavior piece, like I don't mind if they are not doing some classwork but I need to see where they are with a certain skill. And that's not a lot of work throughout like the whole year. They just need to show up on a couple days, get that done. And if they missed it, they need to find some time either in class or outside of class to make up that assessment, if possible. If it's not possible, um, you can use your discretion to excuse them. But I would, by default, not excuse students who are absent. And um, there's a couple of these that are kind of hard to assess three times throughout the year. I think asking questions is kind of a rare one in the NGSS. There's like only three practices or performance expectations in the middle school level where that's actually present. So if there's only three in all three grade levels, you're unlikely to have three assessments for that. So you might have something where you don't actually have three for all of these, or you might have more than three for some of them. And you can easily add in something from the table here so that, that um, you have more categories if you need to for the, the assessments branching it into the table. Um, same thing, um, yeah, with the sheets. And if you were to do it on the slides, but I'd encourage you to do this with sheets where it's semi-automated. So this is an example of what this might look like for a student at the end of the year. Um, you can also do these throughout the year, like you can update this table at each grading period and get a grade for that grading period. And then it kind of incorporates the assignments from the previous grading periods as well. That would be how I would do this. But this is like the end of year when you've got all these different assessments that you've done. Um, you can see here, like asking questions, I've only got one real assessment there. And so the score is pretty simple. It's just what was the one assessment score that they got. But then here you can see that they consistently got a three. So I'm gonna give that to them as their final grade. It's not averaged out from here. The averaging is from all these different categories to the final one. 
but here it's what is their most consistent score throughout this particular skill. Um, and then you can see this student, yeah, they did great at the beginning of the year, but then I wasn't able to see them do that again throughout the year. So I gave them a two for that category. And then here, this student, it's hard to say which one is the most consistent, but I believe that they should get the three here because they demonstrated three at the end of the year. Though there's sometimes where like if they were to get like a three here and then a two there, I might give them a two here or a three. That's kind of debatable. Um, probably the student's going to argue with you if you give them a, um, a two in this situation. So I'd probably give them a three just because it's hard to justify otherwise, though it could be justified to give them a two. Um, here, you can see that this student either didn't do this one or did a very poor job to the point where they weren't even doing the practice. Like if their questions were not even questions, they might get a zero here. Um, but if they've got some questions on here, even if it's off topic, they should be getting a one. So this is kind of hard to say um, just from the table what exactly this was if the student didn't do something. If you want to excuse a student, you might do an A. If they were absent, that's what I would choose to do. But if I see a zero on here, that indicates that they should have done it or they and they didn't or they did such a poor job that wasn't really present. And so I would insist that the student go back and fix that up. But this is sim similar to this situation where they consistently got threes later on. So if they got twos later on, I'm happy with giving that for that score for that practice. Though they might be able to get themselves up to a three if they went back and redid that and then got up to a three level. So you could give that as an opportunity for a student to raise their score instead of doing extra credit. They need to go back to that assignment and do it at a higher level. Then if they've just like said, I'm not doing this one assessment for this one skill, um, then I would give them a zero for that category, which will lower their science grade potentially. But if they're doing well enough in other categories, that they might be okay um, score-wise. Then you can see here, this is another student where this is like a, the three is in the middle and the two is at the end of the year. So you could justify that as a two or a three. Kind of hard to say. Here you can see I've only got one score, so you can put that there. Now for me, I like to have these columns represent different parts of the year as well. So if you did the asking questions earlier in the year, you could put that on the left side. If you did the research project at the end of the year, you could do that kind of in the right side of this table, or you could put that in there. It's kind of personal preference for teachers. Some teachers might be like, I only did one assessment, so I want to put it in this column. Totally makes sense to me to do it that way. You can also see that this is automatically calculated. So if I end up just artificially raising this number up, then they get a different score calculated for them. And I've also got this for the um, for a student here. If they have a failing grade for here, I think that I actually was messing with the numbers in this table just to demonstrate that they're going to, if they've got one, they've got the C. And I'm just going to change a couple more of these numbers actually to the zero. So if I've got like no evidence of anything for the student, then they're going to be getting like a no pass. But that's pretty hard to do. Um, as you can see, like even if they've just gotten ones on half of these, then they're going to be passing the class, which is I'd be I'd be shocked if a student was not able to do that even with an IEP or uh, English being a second language, they should be able to demonstrate at least attempt half of the assignments. And if they're not, then I would say I don't have enough data to accurately score the student. Um, so that kind of makes sense and takes care of that, like students shouldn't fail in a mastery-based grading system. I think students can get like a no grade or a failing grade, but it's basically you saying, I don't have any evidence of them performing even at a weak level. Because if they're performing at a weak level, that would be equivalent to what we would call a C traditionally. But they're way not at grade level, um, strong and like good kind of, good kind of can be considered at grade level, but strong is like, this is, I'm very happy with this. This is what I'm looking for. So that's kind of like at grade level in my brain. So, we can also see um, similar scoring 
guidelines here, I'd probably give this a two because they've consistently shown a two after the three here. It's either a three or a two, that's debatable. Could depend on the situation as well. Um, same sort of same sort of deal here as what we talked about in the other one. It's probably gonna end up being a three and a two. So you can see that I've also got slightly different colors on these two different versions. That's mostly for my benefit. So if I know I've assigned some students the no grade calculator for that version, then I know that that's that version that I've assigned them. You could rename this if you wanted to just have the same name for all students so that kids don't know who's got a um, adjusted scale. Depends on how transparent you want to be with students about that. You can completely hide that and make this the exact same color as well. It's, again, debatable. <laughs> so throughout the year, parents and students are going to wonder what their grade is for different assessments as well as for the whole class. And so how I would recommend you do this is that you put the assessments in the gradebook, but you make them worth zero points in the gradebook because this method isn't just like percentages or like a bundle of points that are being put together. Um, it's all these different things where it's like the most consistent score is then put together. So you can give them things in the grade book so they know how their students are doing throughout the year, but um, really they should be looking at this table. So this table needs to be shared to students and you can give everyone the F version or the pass, no pass version, or you may choose to give some students one version and some students a different version. Um, that kind of depends on your district policy and your personal preference. So if I were to do this in Google Classroom, I would give students an assignment. So if you're in Google Classroom, it looks kind of like this, and you can make an assignment like this. Um, what I would do is just call it the final grade scorecard. Um, and if I'm trying to give different versions to different students, then I'm just going to call it the same thing, irregardless of the version that I'm sharing with them. And um, probably get rid of this F version piece, make a copy for each student, do the topic here. So it's the final grade topic. Um, I would make this ungraded in here. So because it's going to be like a point grade, like you can do four points or three points or whatever, if you want to do that in here. Um, but they really should be looking at the scorecard, so I would, would just keep that ungraded as well. Now, if you want to give some students the F version, you can just assign it individually. This class is only one person, so I can only assign it to that one person, which is all students. But you can do a drop-down menu and select which students to get one version, and then make another assignment with the same title for other students. Or you could just keep everyone on the same version. It uh, de depends on the situation a little bit. But the problem is, is if you try and do this so that you're making a copy for each student, they're going to have editing permission. So let's kind of have a look at what that looks like. If we assign this, then um, I'll, I'll look at this from the teacher perspective so that you can see this at first. Then we've got this final grade assignment in that category. You can look at your student work and view that student's submitted version or the version that they should be um, not submitting, but being able to see. And then here you can see the, um, the history of the files um, as well as put comments, but you don't need to do that on this assignment. Really what you're interested in is kind of entering it in yourself. And the student, unfortunately, is the owner of the file and you can't request permission. Um, it's just kind of frustrating. So you could tell the student, hey, I'm able to see version history. Don't go ahead and um, edit this because I'll be able to see any changes that either you or I have made to this document by looking at that version history. So if I go ahead and make some changes and we look at that history, then you can see who's made what changes. And so you can see if they've altered your scorecard or if it's just been you that's been altering the scorecard. So even if you at this point just want to leave that as is, that's one way to know that you're the one entering in the scores. You can also have the students give you the ownership permission, which then you can turn them into just a viewer. So I'll show you how to do that in just a second. All right, so now I'm looking at this from the student perspective and 
by default, they are kind of able to edit this, but you don't really want them to be able to do that. So if you want to make it so that they no longer have editing access, they need to go into the share and then select the teacher account and say, hey, I'm transferring ownership to the teacher. All right, then when you're viewing this from the teacher profile, you can accept the ownership that the student has given you. And now as the owner, you can then say, hey, student, you're only going to have viewing permission. So the student now can no longer edit this. And that's the probably the best way to go about it, but it's also it takes more steps and it's a little bit unnecessary. I would argue that you could just share the um, assignment or scorecard with them and tell them you don't edit this, I edit this, I can see the version history if you are editing it and make it clear to parents that this is where they are really able to determine what their student's grade is. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than a grade book, but grade books don't have this um, consistency element where you can look at the most consistent score built into them. So I prefer this over just entering everything into the grade book and having it calculate for you because it just doesn't really work with this system. Thank you for McLearning with me. Before you go, please check out the following services that I offer with my business. So if you click the link in my videos, this goes to my website. I might be changing it from Podia because I'm no longer doing the interactive videos for sale. I might put those up for free. Um, but most of my other services are linked here. So you can see that I've got like a Teachers Paid Teachers and a Wiseant. Um, the Teachers Paid Teachers has a lot of my assessments that I have for like the NGSS, as well as lessons that I made when I was actually a teacher in the classroom. So I've got quite a few things like CERs and other things on there. Um, if you want to get one-on-one -on -one live support from me, either like with science or like working on um, like teaching support lessons and that kind of stuff, uh, you can sign up through Wiseant. I have a link to there where you can contact me there um, and we can schedule hourly appointments. Um, and I've got a few other things on here like a Facebook page um, and our social media. And if you're interested in getting professional development with me for like a team of teachers, a whole page with information on that. So yeah, feel free to check that out. Um, thank you.